history panel in our three-part history panel series honoring the 20th anniversary of the Fairness Campaign. Woo! So since we are, since we have fewer mics than I thought, we'll see if this one will go all, oh it does, wonderful, all right. <laughs> okay, so uh, a couple of, of quick things. This is part of the Transgender Week of Awareness. As many of you know, this is the week where we highlight uh, the transgender community and many of the issues that are unique to the trans community, um, including oftentimes the increased discrimination and particularly violence that the trans community faces uh, in the broader LGBT community. And it's important that, that we have this discussion, not just to raise the awareness of these issues, but also to highlight the fact that the fairness campaign for these two decades in our history has been working proactively to be certain that every member of not just the LGBTQ community, but the LGBTQQIAA, insert whatever letter of the alphabet else <laughs> you want to, is included in the work that we do. Because if, if some of you out there are unfamiliar with the work of the campaign, we come from a place of the inherent understanding of intersections of all forms of oppression that racism is classism, is sexism, is homophobia, and that as long as one form of oppression persists, no form of oppression will ever desist. And we cannot dismantle all forms of systemic oppression without addressing every single one of them and making certain that we are talking about every single one of them in everything that we do. And the Fairness Campaign, unlike many other LGBTQ or social justice organizations across the nation has always worked from that place and, and not necessarily all of them have. And when we fought, I say we as if I was here, when the Fairness Campaign fought <laughs> to pass the original Fairness Ordinance in 1999, we did so with the transgender community included from the very beginning, which is not always the case. And with the Fairness Campaign's leadership, we made Louisville not just one of the first cities in the South, but one of the first cities in the entire nation to have fully inclusive anti-discrimination fairness laws protecting folks from discrimination in employment, housing, and public accommodations based on both sexual orientation and gender identity perception. We beat even New York City. By and that's a testament to the work of the co-founders and the early leaders of the campaign who worked all throughout the 90s to get that law passed in 1999. And we worked, that, we worked the state from that same place in that we have never allowed a fairness law to be proposed in the state legislature that did not include the transgender community. So every time, and we have proposed that bill for more than 15 years now, it's never been debated even once. But every time that we propose that measure and lobby for it in Frankfurt, we include gender identity with sexual orientation perception. And trust me, it's not always a popular stance, as it certainly wasn't, and as you'll hear from our panelists, uh, in the early days of fairness here in the city, even our allies will oftentimes tell us that if we would just drop the trans community, if you just get rid of that gender identity, we can get the law passed quicker, and then we'll come back. <laughs> then we'll go back and pass the law for, for the trans community. And I'm certain that you'll hear that from experience, that doesn't happen. That if, if we don't get the law passed with everyone included the first time, if we don't get it right immediately, then we won't ever get it right. And so that's the, that's the place, the historical place or context from which I want you all to enter into this conversation uh, with our esteemed panelists and also to let you know that this is, as I mentioned, not just a, one of our 20th anniversary events, but this is our final 20th anniversary oh. event <laughs> in, a, in a whole host of, uh, yeah, this is yeah, the super bonus round, which means that all of you tonight, uh, if you'll visit the fairness information table before you leave, uh, we'll get to take home with you a 20th anniversary fairness campaign lapel pin to commemorate uh, this occasion and this year. So I do want to thank you all for being here. And now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel here. 
and I'm going to give them all an opportunity uh, to uh, to share their their fairness story, their coming in story in this work, and share their experience about how the fairness campaign has done this work from a place of of trans inclusion and inclusion of everyone within our community. Um, I'll ask all the panelists to keep their comments to three to five minutes or so. So that some of them I know, including myself, have the uh, propensity to wax poetical at some time. So so we'll we'll look to keep it brief so that we've got plenty of time for question and answers, and we still get you all out of here in in, a, in about an hour. Um, so that we, we are respectful of everyone's time. So uh, I'll introduce everyone first, uh, and then I'm going to ask, uh, not quite in this order, for them to make their comments. So to my immediate left, please give a warm round of applause to Beth Harrison Prado, an early fairness leader and community educator. And then to best left, we have K.A. Owens, a Fairness Campaign Leadership Council member and co-chair of the Kentucky Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. <laughs> and then a Fairness Campaign co-founder and our first staffer and now the program coordinator of the University of Louisville's Office for LGBT Services, Lisa Gunterman. <laughs> And then again, longtime fairness campaign leader and current co-chair of our political action committee, the Committee for Fairness and Individual Rights, as well as a Louisville Metro Human Relations Commissioner, yes. Dawn Wilson. <laughs> and then last but certainly not least, a longtime fairness supporter, as well as the co-founder and archivist of the Williams Nichols Archives at the University of Louisville Library, David Williams. <laughs> And so, uh, we, we won't go quite chronologically, I, I'm going to ask actually Dawn Wilson to, uh, to address you all first, so once again, a warm round for Dawn Wilson! <laughs> oh, good lord. <laughs> I'm glad to see all these shining faces out there. Um, oh, where do I need to start? <laughs> I, um, I came to this work a little, um, I need, I need to bring a couple of people into the room who are not here tonight. Mm -hmm. Lori Rebelson, mm -hmm. Patty Hall. Mm -hmm. yes. Those two right up front. Yes. When I was coming out, when I was trying to get my head around, um, you know, how to meet people, how to what was going on, they started or had started a group called LGS, Global Gender Society, and I remember calling, and, and here's how I found them. I didn't find them just by, you know, calling the fairness campaign. I didn't even know that existed. I was calling Pennsylvania to a friend of mine named Joanne, and she ran Renaissance, and she said, why are you calling me? You got a group in Louisville, and I said, what group in Louisville? <laughs> and she said, oh, they're doing great work in Louisville. What, what group in Louisville? And she introduced me to Lori Rousseau and Patty Hall. And I was a member of that group, along with Rachel Stewart. And I remember walking in, scared to death, and just getting my sea legs. I want to fast forward a little bit because as Lori began to remove herself, remember I said Lori was the first EMT in Louisville. Um, there was an incident in 1995. Tower Hunter. What many people in this room, some know, some don't know, but what many people don't know, Tyra and I knew each other only in passing, but Sister Tyra Hunter was part of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, which was the church I came from, and she was allowed to be murdered. Not by just bullets, a car accident, and she was allowed to bleed out on the sidewalk. I have worked in Washington for Senator Mitch McConnell in 87 and 89. I had some skills, and it was at that point when I was at Southern Comfort, and Southern Comfort was very young in those days. I ended up going and helping my family, my friends, my colleagues, 
people at the time I didn't know, who are now my friends and families and colleagues, lobby for their rights. They didn't know what they were doing. I had to say, teach them. I mean, they were getting bad information, and I said, no, if you don't do it that way, do it this way. When I came back, Patty came to me and she said, you know, you really need to work with the fairness community and work with them because we are having some issues. You have to understand, at that time, in 95, I was living in Lexington. I was driving to Louisville uh, just to go to a gender group. And as time would have it, we began to, you know, set up a, a one in Lexington, and we called it BGB, and LGS was still there. And at one point, the two became one. So, this one particular evening, and I'm going to bring somebody else in the room, F.M. Chester. F.M. calls me and says, hey, Don, I need a favor. We have a couple of older people who don't get it. And I said, what do you mean they don't get it? No, they don't get gender identity. Can you come and help me? And I said, sure. So I came and I brought with me Ann Casefear, Angela Bridgman, and Lisa, you was there as I remember. You were there, Carla. And, you know, Beth, I don't know if you were there or not, but I remember it was George, uh, George Unsel, mm -hmm. Tina Ward Pugh, Scotty Green, who was scared shitless, excuse my French, <laughs> but he was. And we began to explain to them what it meant. And I remember the look in George's face. He crossed his arms, he leans back, and he says, I don't understand a lot of this, but I do understand that rights are rights and that people need to be protected. And, you know, I understand that. I get that. And at that point, Carla had come back in the room and we ended up meeting with the mayor later on, not the same night, but later on that week. And that he didn't get it until it was like, look, here's what it is. You're judging somebody by what you perceive they are or are not. And that is getting people hurt, it's getting people killed, it's getting people to lose their jobs. The whole time I'm doing this, I'm working for him. So, as time went on, um, there's a picture that I love in the fairness office where we're FM and I and a bunch of us holding up signs saying thank you when the county was passed. That was on my birthday. I will never forget that day. Because I remember what it took to get there. We testified, Ann testified, Angela testified, Patty testified, FM testified, Lisa, you testified. I, I can't begin to name. Cindy Lee testified. There were so many people you know, who testified at those hearings. Corradino had those hearings all over the county, and they testified at every one. I know I hit four. I know some people hit six. And that was, that was when people began to understand that this was something that we need to include. And, we, and nowadays, we're hearing about bathroom issues. We had that problem here, too. You know, they come back and say, well, you know, what about the bathroom? You know, we don't want blah, 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 blah. You've all heard it. I will not dignify it. But it was a simple reaction to that because Ann was the one who was, who was a business person, and she goes, wait a minute, why don't you just do this? Give the employers the opportunity to make the choice. Mm -hmm. And the mayor was like, oh, no, 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 no. It went. It went from the county. It went again. And we thought we had shot the moon because we, we passed it, and it was great, it was grand, but what do you do next? And so we continued, many of us continued to work with the campaign, we continued to educate ourselves, we continued to go and learn about media studies and things like that. And we start talking to employers. And I know personally I had been blacklisted by a certain church in town because of my stance with the fairness community. And that's not a story I want to be on to here. We'll probably get into it later because I want other people to talk about their stories. But what was so phenomenal about that 
is that here we were working together. I mean, trans people were licking envelopes. They were writing articles, thanks to David. Uh, you know, I was one of the people who wrote articles for him. And we all know Monica Roberts and, and uh, yes. uh, Tina wrote and, and, and Rachel at one time. That had never happened anywhere else in the country. And here's where it happened at. But in 2004, we were shaken to our core because the marriage initiative came up. And people were, you know, like, well, trans people are not going to help us because it has nothing to do with them. Uh, I help install the internet in the building. <laughs> I crawl and I put wires in. And I worked with a gay man who was a good friend of mine. And we had a couple of trans people who used everything they could. And we fought, we talked, we did everything we could. And it lost. And I remember sitting there with Mandy Carter in my house. And Randy goes, this isn't over. And she was right, because right after that, Hal Heiner said, we're going to bring the fairness up for review, and we're going to get rid of it, blah, blah, blah. Well, fast forward again. Because in 2004, in December, I walked out of my fencing club, and I told them I may not be back. Because I was afraid. And I remember sitting there with Bobby Washington and Eric Granicher and Jeff and all of them, and we didn't have a lethal. Lethal was going to start it. And I remember they spent 30 minutes talking garbage and made no sense. And we got up, and in 30 minutes we ran about 20 people through. And they were begging. The other side was begging for time. And they 20. And basically, all I had to say was like, "Look, you have all these reasons. We have economics. We have you know business here." We have personal stories. What else do you need? And when it was all said and done, they did the most egregious thing they could. They sent out nasty grams and some horrible stuff, and they lost. And it was a stunning victory. We knew then we knew who our enemies were. But the community pulled together. I mean, I remember talking to uh, you know council people and working with Seafair and interviewing people and saying, like, "Look, this is what this is." You know, this is my life. You know, I used to get, and I still get it to this day, what's the sister doing with the two queens look? Anybody, anytime, they never understood that there was, they would say, in the black community, would be told, well, it's a, a white thing, it's a white disease. I'm sorry, I'm here to tell you, you know, there are so many beautiful black queens out there. It's not even funny. And beautiful people of Asian descent, Hispanic descent, I met them. Very smart. You probably don't even know Coco Irimoto. She is the first elected transgendered person. She was elected statewide and statewide <coughs> superintendent of instruction. That's like secretary of education. Okay? She's on her second term. She probably will run for U.S. Senate. You know? Personal <coughs> friend of mine. You know, you got people who are sitting as judge, the Honorable Phyllis Fry. Uh, down in Houston. And I'm going to bring one more person into this room because they were instrumental in my last piece and I'm going to turn it over to somebody else. And I'm going to say, was it 2010, 2009, the Jefferson County School Board? Two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah, 2009. No, uh, 08. 08. And, and the reason I ask because I, I get it's, it's, it's really, it's fresh, but it's kind, of, it's kind of strong. You know, we have this beautiful law that protects us. It's got public accommodations. People are debating public accommodations across the country, um, especially in Massachusetts, where they about ready to cut public accommodations. They're going to give you everything else, but you can't go and live in, go to a hotel. I mean, we're not going to allow that. Or use a bathroom, okay? In this city, where we have all that, they brought it up in the Jefferson County Public Schools, and they said, hey, we're going to match, you know, we want to match the city. There were some arguments, well, does it the state has to override, or does the city have to override? And we were like, no, everybody has to be involved. And we thought we had the votes. And Monica, I was working, and Monica said, well, I'll go down, and, and I represent the trans community, and I work with fairness. She had done some work on CFAIR as our secretary. 
and she stood there, and those of you who have ever read Trans Grill, you know how fiery she is. If you've been here for the past uh, Transgender Week of Remembrances and things like that, you know who I'm talking about. She stood there, her and Tina, and made the case, because we had transgender students, transgender teachers, and we had one person who said, I can't vote. Matter of fact, turn the vote around on us. And everybody was crestfallen. Now, in many other cities, the trans community would say, screw it, we just, you know, we're not going to help you, whatever. I am very proud of my brothers and sisters in this town <coughs> because not only did they say, okay, we got burned, wasn't their fault, we know who you are, we'll deal with you later, we're going to fight and get the rights for those who you say you will support. And that was a tough fight. But Monica made the case, mm -hmm. being a teacher's kid. And it passed. Here it is, 2011, and earlier this year, uh, I was made a commissioner in 2010, and I had the first opportunity the day before Easter to confront the school board about gender identity being left out of the law. Imagine their surprise to see a setting education chair calling them out for leaving <coughs> me out of the picture mm -hmm. and I said and you got teachers out there and you know what one of them told me you know I talked to the HR department and they don't have a problem with them I said honey I've been working in my job for 10 years my HR department calls me up when they got a problem and it's usually with the gay folk it ain't with the trans folk <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean it's funny but you know I did not get the call I say this to say I say that to say this we will get the second bite of the apple, I promise you. And as Human Relations Commissioner, I am already working to get that hearing held at the beginning of next year or as soon as we can possibly schedule it and get gender identity added in there so that we can actually have one of the strongest statements to be made to the city and to the state and to this country that Louisville stands as a total Fairness, family. Hey everybody, I'm Lisa Gunterman. I'm with the Office of LGBT Services. And the funny thing about that is about 20 years ago, Brian Buford, who's the director of the office, used to call me over the Fairness Campaign saying, hey, I've been asked to speak in a class. Will you join me so I don't have to speak alone? <laughs> so last yeah. week I got to tell Brian, Hey, I got a call from the Fairness Campaign. They want me to speak on a panel, so it's kind of come full circle for me. Um, my story is more, does anybody remember the Life commercial where the two brothers are looking at this maybe healthy cereal? Yeah. And they're like, let's get Mikey, he'll try it. Um, that's kind of more my story. Um, and, and the reason that is, is because when it came time to explain gender identity to uh, my buddy, Steve Mongrey, um, somebody in the room said, let's get Lisa. He likes her. So, um, what's, and what's wild for me in my story is that it probably wasn't until, I don't know, 93, that I realized that my sisters and brothers and the G and L community didn't have the same day-to-day -day experience that I did. That I had more in common with my transgender brothers and sisters because of my gender performance and how I live every day. Because I was sitting in a room and I'm like, you know how when you go shopping and you don't, don't get waited on or you know I would just talk about the experiences of brushes with violence or harassment from police and you know and they kept going no we don't know what you're talking about and all of that was more was less because of my orientation and more of my gender performance and how how I'm perceived in the world and how I walk around in the world and you know, my partner was even like, that's not real, you know, about, you know, like, we, really, nobody waits on you when you go shopping? So I'm like, watch. So when we got together, you know, she would go with me and she's like, wow, you really don't, you're like invisible. So, um, so I was happy to talk to my friend Steve Magre and um, part, of, part of that story I think that's so important to talk about is our ability to transform hearts and minds by telling our personal stories. Um, we had already been voted down at least three times by the time he and I really had, I guess it was before the third vote where he voted no, that he and I, um, we had a lobby meeting and you know at Fairness we like to process and analyze and 
if the three of us are going to lobby, you're going to say this and stay on script, you're going to stay, say this, I'm going to stay on this. So we get to this meeting with him, and as people are talking, and somebody's sharing statistics about economics, somebody's sharing statistics about the religious community, whatever, I'm looking at him and I'm like, he doesn't care about any of this. So I decided to go off script, which made my colleagues very nervous, and I thought, I, I decided to reframe what I was going to talk about and connect with him as a human being if it's the last thing that I did before I left the office. So instead of going on whatever I was going to share, I started looking at the object in, in his room that mattered to him, and I said, you know, Alderman Magre, that picture of the 97 flood reminds me of how my grandparents met during the 37 flood here in Louisville. My grandfather worked for the Red Cross, my grandmother worked for the Brown Hotel. She didn't know how to swim and she was afraid to walk up the Whiskey Barrel Bridge up Broadway, so my grandfather pulled up in his Red Cross rescue boat and pulled her from the window. And I, I, I linked how, you know, he's from Germantown. My dad grew up a few streets away on Ash Street. And I just kept peppering our conversation with, you know, we have more in common than we do different. And he still voted no. But from that point on, anytime he saw me, he gave me a hug in the hallway or whatever, and everybody was like, what are you doing? You know, because he was a perceived opponent. And I think that word is very important because everybody's a potential ally. We might perceive them as an opponent today, but they are potentially an ally. So like you said, you know, people I invited, myself and Chester and Don, and you know, we had different folks going to talk to him about, here's what this really means. We're talking about people like me. And it, it disarmed him, and he's like, oh, okay, like I'm, I know he wasn't totally comfortable with that. I grew up in a family with men just like him, so I, I knew that was a challenge for him. But he was able to connect and go, okay, I don't, I don't quite get it, but all right. Um, the other thing that I think is important to, to talk about, and, and you touched on this as well, is um, the reason fairness passed is not because our GLBT community was so fiercely organized. It passed because of our allies. And the story of Councilman Unsel will always go down as just such a powerful example to me as what it means to be an ally and my role and, and his, his modeling of what being an ally looks like. And he was, I don't know, four times my height. He just seemed like a giant <laughs> among men. And his words held such power in meeting because he, he spoke when it mattered. And he listened to this whole conversation and finally leaned back in his chair and put his feet clear across the, I mean, they went to clear across the middle of the room. It was so tall. And he said, I may not ever get all the terms, but as a black man, I get discrimination. And that's wrong. It's going in the ordinance. And that, that was so powerful for all of us. Um, the other thing I'm proud of for our community that you had touched on is I, I know that we always have to do education around identity and how what words people are comfortable using and things like that, but I don't remember inside the fairness campaign ever feeling like I had to defend why gender identity went in the ordinance. There were all kinds of people outside going, I mean, I felt like they were selling me something like, Psst, come here, you know, if you take that out of there, it'll pass. People on the board of aldermen were saying that, people at national conferences were saying that, I mean, they, they looked down on us because we're from Kentucky at national conferences, Carla was mentioning that earlier, you know, we'd be at NGLTF and they're like, hi, oh, you people from Kentucky don't know how to do this. And we're like, really? Because you still don't have it in the law in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I'm so proud of is um, we had already lost three times together. I would rather lose together than win and leave people behind. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person. I don't to exclusion because we, we all know how that feels. Harrison Prado, and I think I want to clarify something. I'm not an early fairness leader. Sorry. Not earlier than you, but That's not. Right. Okay. <laughs> I actually came to Louisville in 2002, and I had heard about fairness in 2001 at Creating Change at a National Gay and Gay Task Force conference. And it's like I, I was listening to people talk about trying to pass non discrimination ordinances and citing Kentucky. Now, I was living in Michigan at the time. When I was in Michigan, I was in Michigan for graduate school, and University of Michigan Ann Arbor has the oldest office in the country that does what LGBT services does now. Of course, it started out doing only gay services, but you know. It, it. But I got there in 95. And in 95, the T was not part of the name. I had to fight, well, me and a number of other people 
Actually, there weren't that many of us initially. Fought for three years to get the T added. It's more than just an initial, right? But part of that reflects what was going on. I mean, if you think about it, the concept of transgender, the term transgender in any kind of common usage, is about as young as or old as parents is. Yeah. It hasn't been around a long time. Our experience has been around a long time, but the concept of what, how we do this hasn't been. And it certainly hasn't been around as a political or an organizing, organizing concept. So one of the things that's always been a tension has been the tension between LGB, well, L B still struggles, okay, let's not, let's not pretend. Mm -hmm. Bisexual people are continually marginalized. They're wrapped up, sucked up into this whole thing. We're not real good with the B part. Um, but the LGB and the T were like us, them things. And it was like, well, and I've heard, I've heard trans folk do this too before. Our issues are different. When I lived in North Carolina, I'm going to just call it out here. When I lived in North Carolina, Jesse Helms was a senior senator. Nope. As far as he was concerned, we were all perverts. So it's like we, we do better standing together than we do dividing our, dividing our strengths. So in, in Ann Arbor, one of the things that I was struck by, here this is a, this is a city that has had a non-discrimination policy around sexual orientation for several decades at that point. And it had the LGB campus office for several decades at that point. But they did not include trans folk. They didn't include it. Granted, in 93 is the first time I really came to terms with the concept for myself. And it was only after meeting Kate Bornstein and getting called out by her. Okay, so if you don't know Kate Bornstein, getting called out by her is, is, is a daunting yeah. prospect. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. But I had grown up Butch. I had known that, I've known that, that's been my experience my entire life. Then I served in the military for a decade. And the, let's be, let, the fact about the military is regardless of your sex, everybody's masculine. So I learned a different kind of masculinity than that. Okay? And then, I, okay, so then I became a civilian and I became a student. And I began to, I began to take apart and understand these, the, common, the, 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 the inter intersections, all the, 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 to use the academic term, the intersectionality of all the different kinds of ways we divvy ourselves up, par parcel ourselves out, pigeonhole ourselves, and then start Privilege, privileging each other, or ourselves over each other. It was a challenging thing to be in Ann Arbor, Michigan, with all this progressive thinking, and realize that Louisville, Kentucky was getting right. Yeah. <laughs> so I moved. I came here. <laughs> uh, but when I came here, one of the things I, wanna, I will say, it has been true that gender identity has been an integral part of the mission. It has not always been an understood part of the community. Mm -hmm. And that is a challenge. It has not always been an understood, it's not always been, it is not a unilateral understanding in the trans community. Mm -hmm. We do this hierarchical thing too sometimes. I have had my transgender credentials, my butch credentials, my female <coughs> credentials, and at times my human credentials challenged not just by the folks outside of our community, mm -hmm. but within this community as well. When I, when I became aware of that most pointedly, <coughs> since I've lived in Louisville, salute, was when it, it was coming up in 2004, where the whole conversation was coming up. And folks were, there was tension. There was still tension. Within our community, there is still, there is still tension. Yeah. And I'm using community in a broad scope, including allies of, of all ilk. But when we, when we emphasize the differences, what is it, that wonderful, beautiful quote? Don't ever forget I'm black. Remember, remember, always remember that I'm black. Don't ever immediately. I can't remember how it goes. But at the same time that you cannot forget who and what I am, we're all the same. And we, we all, I'm not getting it. Okay, here's the deal. I was in grown up, I've got to give this caveat. I'm in blue jeans today because I was in grown up clothes all day and my brain was turned on there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the token rebel up here in the blue jeans and my brain's not working right. But I think you get, you think you get what I'm trying to say here. It's about where we find the commonalities. And when we, when, when, when Louisville accepted, adopted the ordinance that said we are all human, we all deserve respect, we all deserve to be able to live with dignity and integrity, and we all deserve to be our authentic selves, whatever and however that looks. Yes. So, 
when, when Louisville adopted that, it became more than just policy. Mm -hmm. And I have watched in the, in the years since I moved here, I've watched this community become more embracing the practice of it too, not just the policy. Policies are good, but policies are only pieces of paper if we're not really living it. Yeah. So while we still have find our places of difference, there are, we, we all stand to gain much, much more. Well, last thing I'll say is this. I used to teach, um, well, a variety of classes up in Ann Arbor, but one of the things we would do is trans 101, and I've done it here a number of times and so. Mm -hmm. yeah. And folks, we get this, this debate, okay, why does it matter to LGB folks what trans folks do, and why, blah, blah, blah. And so the question is this, okay, in the end, when somebody's getting bullied when they're a little kid, or somebody's getting bullied as an adolescent, or somebody's getting bashed as an adult. Odds are, it's not because because of who they kissed or who they are, who they're going home to at the end of the night. It's because they stepped across somebody's idea of what gender is supposed to be. Yes. The yes. first thing we all learn before we learn our race, our religion, or anything else, is whether we're boys or girls. And when some of us challenge the concept that that's a static condition, yeah. it freaks people out. Yeah. Yeah. It freaks us out to get our own pigeonholes rearranged. So the next time, whether it's about trans stuff, whether it's about queer stuff, whether it's about whatever stuff, if you're getting your buttons punched, I have a good friend that says, if you're getting your buttons punched, think about what you got to learn. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. for coming tonight. Uh, I think my part of the uh, uh, program here is uh, dealing with uh, the history of this a little bit and putting the uh, fairness ordinance in a little historical contents, uh, context. Uh, and I know a lot of people say history, uh, <laughs> but I think it's very fascinating, uh, uh, the little thing that I've come up with here. Uh, I think like a lot of us here tonight, uh, we were there on that cold January night in 1999 when fairness was finally passed. Mm -hmm. And not only was it uh, passed to, to protect gays and lesbians and bisexuals, but uh, they also included transgenders. And I thought to myself, we didn't just get the whole banana, we got the banana sundae with the ice cream and the cherry. <laughs> And I, I was really kind of shocked. I thought, how in the hell did they do this? <laughs> yeah. Because uh, up until that point in, in the entire United States, from 1975 till 1998, only 23 other cities and towns and states had passed an ordinance or law that uh, protected gays and lesbians as well as transgenders. <coughs> I don't know if any of you all know uh, what the first uh, jurisdiction of uh, was uh, the, the past uh, transgender ordinance. It was in 1975, any guess? Minneapolis, yeah. Minnesota. <laughs> 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 oh, I was hoping for a... Did they win a Maris? Yeah, I... <laughs> 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 Macy wins the golden... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew we had door prizes? Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was Minneapolis in 1975. Uh, closer to home, Champaign and Urbana in Illinois, they passed the ordinance. They were college towns in the late 70s. But even up until 1990, there was only six places in the entire country that had transgender uh, protections. Uh, things picked up a little bit in the 1990s. Uh, uh, before Louisville, there were 17 other places. Um, I think one of the, there's two things, though, that we need to think of when we're talking about the 1990s. First of all, uh, some of these, these places, you would think that they would have come around to passing transgender ordinances long before they actually did. San Francisco, for instance, didn't pass their ordinance until 1994. This was 16 years after they passed the Gay and Lesbian Ordinance. Uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, home of Harvard, and all those other colleges, they didn't get around to it until um, 1995, I think. Uh, West Hollywood, the, the gayest place in the country, <laughs> didn't uh, pass their ordinance until uh, less than a year before Louisville. So 
it really is kind of odd for us to think today that these so-called liberal bastions took so long to, uh, to do this. Uh, a second uh, aspect of the ordinances and laws that was passed in the 90s is we start to see how they were starting to spread uh, out into the country. Um, places that you would never think of were beginning to consider these laws and to put them on the books. So places like Iowa City, Iowa. Well, that's a college town, the University of Iowa. But uh, you also have uh, places like Toledo, Ohio. Who thought? Toledo, Ohio, you know, a very Catholic uh, area uh, of uh, the Midwest would pass an ordinance um, protecting transgenders. So, um, and in 1999, we finally passed our ordinance. It uh, was, we were the 24th city in the nation to do so. And like I say, I, I just couldn't be prouder of Louisville for doing that. At the time, I was editor of the letter. Um, and so I, I wasn't really involved in all the uh, uh, work that was uh, having to go on with uh, getting the ordinance passed. I had decided early on when I became editor that I probably should not be a member of any group because this would be a conflict of interest. So I was more on the sidelines just observing and recording and saving stuff for the archives and that stuff. Um, but, uh, so I, I can't to talk about all the innards uh, that was going on, all the meetings. I didn't have meetings or anything. But I was there in a supportive role, I think, and um, uh, helping out as uh, much as I could. Since um, the uh, 1999 ordinances in Louisville and Lexington and Jefferson County, uh, I, I like to think that in many ways we got the ball rolling. Maybe it was the zeitgeist, maybe um, you know, it was just time for the country to come around to considering transgender uh, protections. But uh, sometimes I think, well, you know, the rest of the country looked at little Louisville and said, damn, if they can do it, why can't we? <laughs> so, uh, you know, and it's really surprising. Um, we passed our ordinance um, of Ann Arbor. Uh, didn't pass theirs until I think a couple of years later. Wow. Portland, Oregon, Atlanta. Atlanta didn't get around it until 2002. Philadelphia, Chicago, Boston. All these places where you would think they would have these kind of protections, they didn't pass them until after we did. So, you know, we have a lot to be proud of there. And of course, the granddaddy of them all. New York City. <laughs> New York City passed their gay rights ordinance in 1986. They didn't get around to transgenders until 2002. I think on a sadder note, uh, on a sadder note, the, the problem is that we're at the southern state. That's not a problem. But uh, the problem is that throughout the rest of uh, the South, there's only a handful of places that have transgender ordinances in place. New Orleans and Atlanta, uh, Columbus, South Carolina. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> but, and, and then a lot of places in Florida, Miami Beach and like Gainesville, uh, a few other college towns. But outside of that, there, there's not just, uh, of course there's no gay rights ordinances, but there's no transgender ordinances. Not even the Golden <coughs> Triangle in Western North Carolina. You would think with all those college towns in Raleigh and Duke and um, those that they would have come around to you know, passing these uh, ordinances. They have gay rights ordinances in place, but they don't have transgenders. So the, uh, our work is cut out for us, but um, I, I, I think uh, the record still stands. We were the 24th place to do it, and now there's 114 mm -hmm. last count, according to the Transgender Law and Policy Institute website. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, Louisville, Lexington, and Jefferson County, um, we can all be very proud of what we accomplished, and uh, I'm just amazed that we did it. Yeah. <laughs> we have talent up here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm uh, really proud to be uh, here with this panel tonight, and really proud to be with all of you. Uh, I'm Kay Owens. Uh, I'm co-chair of the Kentucky Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression. Uh, 
the Kentucky Alliance was founded in the mid-1970s, and I joined in the mid-1990s. And by the time I got there, uh, Kentucky Alliance was fully in support of uh, what folks now call gay rights, including the, uh, all the initials, uh, uh, I-T-Q. And so it was never a discussion by the time I got there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've all, all, always been proud to work with the Fairness Campaign. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, a little bit later than that, I had the opportunity, uh, was proud to do so, to join the Coordinating Committee of the Fairness Campaign myself. Mm -hmm. So. I always thought that fairness folk were cool because all the ones I met were. <laughs> <laughs> so when I joined uh, the Kentucky Alliance in the mid '90s, fairness folks were always working with us on all the, all the issues, so I knew them all. And uh, at that time, the folks that were around, and it was just just a natural thing to join the coordinating committee. And uh, it, was, uh, been, it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. I'm still on the leadership council of fairness campaign. I still follow the email traffic. And, Every once in a while, I express an opinion, you know. So, so I'm still out. So I'm still there in case uh, you know I'm needed. Uh, but uh, uh, working with fairness, being a part of fairness, has been a great experience. It's been a great part of my life. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Uh, uh, Ann Braden, of course, was alive uh, 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 when I started, and. Uh, yeah, it was fun in those days. I mean, it was, it was, it was fun. I mean, it, it's like being a part of history where there's ups and downs and, and mean things and hard things and cruel things, but still it's kind of the best, it's hard for the rest of your life sometimes to match up to the great battles that, you, yeah. that you've been in. Uh, so the great battles, the great fights, the great struggles, the great conflicts are kind of what make up your life. Uh, I mean, when you write the story of your life, sometimes it's hard to write about. I got up in the morning and went to the store, you know, uh, and then I mowed the lawn. So, and, you know, but when you talk about how you went to City Hall and fought for, you went to Frankfurt and fought for, and I'm not sure all of you know the names, uh, that is, they mention a lot of political figures that some of you may or may not know. Steve Margrave, of course, was president of the Board of Aldermen, yeah. and that's who George Unsell, who's dead now, he, he was uh, 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 on the Board of Aldermen, and some of these folks are, are uh, very well known to some of us, and to some of you who are, are a little bit newer, a little bit younger, you may not, may not know. but. Uh, they're part of the history of fairness too. That is the, the evolution and their philosophy and their thinking uh, is sort of symbolic of how fairness got to uh, uh, where it is. And so, and I will say this too, that for a lot of folks, political folks on the old board of aldermen, and a lot of us sort of uh, you know made our bones and learned all of our skills on the old board. Old, the old board of aldermen, the board of men. That's how we learn how to do it. Uh, some of them will admit it, and I think Sharon Bryant is one, but that's sort of the best part of their lives, too. The fact that we as citizens, we as activists, were down at City Hall beating the drum for the cause, that's the high point of their lives as in government. All those great battles. It really is because even for them, when they write the book about their life in politics, it's not too exciting to say, uh, uh, I got $20,000 to fix the sidewalk in front of Mr. But that's important. Fixing the sidewalk in front of Mrs. Smith's house is important. You know, uh, uh, that's important, no doubt. And, uh, uh, because uh, the people on my street, they call Tina. You know, you know they ask me to call Tina because they, they think I know her. So they say, you call Tina. But, uh, uh, so they just say, you do it. But, uh, but uh, uh, when they write their book about their life in government, what they're going to write about is the great battles in, of their time in government. 
and the whole fairness experience is one of the great sort of epic dramas in the history of city of Louisville. No doubt. I mean, what were they going to write about except if they write a book about their life of government, they can't write it without the fairness battles. So, uh, so we didn't burden them. We added to their <laughs> lives. We really did. So make no mistake about it. Uh, and uh, it may have seemed, and, and I think that the people of Louisville, the great battles of those days, uh, it forced the entire city to grow. It really did. Even if you were just watching on the news or, or, or reading it in the paper or discussing it at the barber shop or at the beauty shop, as the case may be, or, uh, so uh, at the water cooler, it was at, it was forcing everybody to grow in their thinking at the time, and really forcing Louisville to be a better place than it would have been without it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, and Louisville is blessed to have kind of a, a sophisticated civil rights, social justice community that I think yes. is underrated. I don't think it's really recognized outside of Louisville. So, we're really lucky to be a part of it. I mean, I was lucky in the 90s to come in where there was some great folks still alive and to, to hand down some things to me. There were some great, great young leaders uh, who, were, who had a lot going on and still do that I, you know, to work with. So uh, my experience in social justice, my experience in fairness has been all up. I mean, it's been all great. Yeah, uh, and uh, I hope that all of you, some of you maybe, or haven't had a part, haven't had a chance to chance to be as, as closely involved as you would wish. Uh, there's still a lot to do. So, uh, uh, so yes. Uh, we'll take a uh, handful of questions from the crowd. This precarious microphone. If anybody's got one. Um, yes, Holly. I don't have a question. I just want to thank you all. Oh, 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 thank, you. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any burning desires out there? Lingering questions? Yes. I want to echo what she said also, but thank you all, because when I'm not at seminary, I work with college students, and some of them have that identity issue. But I appreciate your strength and your courage. And what happened, and also to kind of going back to the quote, even though I'm African American, I don't know the quote to which you were referring. However, yes. I do have one that's kind of a blanket quote by Eleanor Roosevelt: "No one can make you feel inferior without your permission." Thank you. And that's what I share with students when they come to me and they need that I'm struggling type of, uh, you know, advice or counsel, if you will. And I always tell them, "No one can make you feel inferior without your." Thank you. I have a question. Oh, oh. Yeah, let me go ahead. See. Oh. Go ahead. You all can fight over it, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll defer to you first. Go for it, Mark. Well, my question is uh, the bathroom thing. Because oh, yeah. I keep, you know, I keep, we keep talking about it, and I keep going into places where it's not necessary to have a woman's bathroom and a men's bathroom. <laughs> and they, you know, like if I'm in charge of the place for a day, like, like you know, if I'm doing something, I will make a sign and say human bathroom. <laughs> yes, like, you know, to, but then I have seen that then they go back to the men's bathroom and the women's bathroom. And so what's, you know, are we making any progress? what battles are out there. For those in the back, uh, Mari's uh, asking about bathrooms, and uh, I think I'll just say bathroom panic, and then hand it over. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. okay uh, so that I'm going to respond to this too, but one of the things I'll tell you is, one of the things that has happened is it's actually become case law, okay? This bathroom fight, we call it, okay, when we're doing the training, we call it potty training. <laughs> 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 because the fundamental thing, 
the, the arguments fall apart for, 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 for discriminating against somebody in the work, especially in the workplace. It's two places that are really show up. Workplaces and, co and schools, college campuses, yeah. high school, especially college campuses. That's where it shows up. That was actually the catalyst for getting trans added to, uh, to University of Michigan's uh, student services because students were getting bashed. I was one of them, getting bashed walking out of restrooms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the Society of Human <coughs> The Society of Human Resource Management Professionals it cites case law in about four different states, including New York and in Wisconsin. It says fundamentally a person's right to go to the bathroom is not determined by their plumbing, it's determined by the way they present in the world. Yes. So case law basically says that a person is, is entitled to use the restroom in which they are going to feel most comfortable. It's not about your comfort. I mean, it's not about other people's comfort, right? Yeah. So, like, and I'll give you an example. When people use the restrooms, and we're not going to go into the long, long training here, but the short version is people need to go to the bathroom. Where the panic comes up is about, it's usually in the couch in the terms of women being afraid of having a man in a dress in the restroom. And that is a bogus argument. Yes. Because if somebody was truly worried about being in the bathroom, they would, she, she I mean, there are, there's a legitimate, here's the problem. There's a legitimate concern about sexual assault. There is a legitimate concern. Yeah. But the, the argument against trans inclusion in restrooms is, it's, it's, it's a smoke screen. It's a, very, it's a different conversation. It's a long training. That's a whole training around potty training. The short version is this. If a person's going to the restroom, that's what they're going for. The whole thing about bathrooms is, it's, a, it's an emotionally loaded issue. And one of the things that any organization or agency can do to make itself compliant, if you, if you have an organizational policy to be ADA compliant, the 100% ADA compliant bathroom is a single user locking, locking yes. restroom that is handicapped accessible. If you have that restroom and you label it with a gender, you're immediately discriminating. If you simply say it's a restroom, you satisfy. I will tell you, I always will look, I know I, for years I knew the only safe bathrooms on the entire campus of University of Michigan. I can tell you the safe bathrooms in this town. And I will tell you that when I go to the go to airports, I will always look for the family restrooms. Yes. Yeah. Because they lock. And they're one single, single use. Usually, um, yes, yeah, single, single use. You want this to? Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, just keep it for us to just run the cord back and forth. I'll pull the cord out. There we go. Here, put it between. Excuse the technical difficulties. Got it. Mari, to answer your question, there have been some changes since mm -hmm. that, uh, since the law passed in 99, 2004, and even in Lexington. In Lexington, they passed the law 12-3. Okay? Um, the changes came as a result of what was done here when it was brought up that the employers, well, the employers can't handle this, or you're going to hurt businesses with this bathroom issue. The first thing I said to a lot of the automatic people, and even the mayor, is like, do you have a men's and a women's bathroom in your house? <laughs> I know. I mean, seriously, I don't have two. I just have, you know, I have a one, and it doesn't matter. And when you put it on that basic line, people go, yeah, well, that makes sense. And then, you know, we understand that there are some things that happen and, and, and some fears that people have. I understand that. But if I gotta go to the restroom, I gotta go to the restroom. The main thing that was people used, especially the churches, was that's a private place for people. Now, you know, Beth, I know you know, and a lot of people know, you know, how many times have I, well, let's put it this way, I've gotten pulled into the women's restroom for tons of conversations that had nothing to do with anything bathroom related, okay? <laughs> I mean, there have been more than my share of meetings in the lace room, and I were not the cause of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but it also has spared some, uh, spurred some serious changes in the law. Unisex bathrooms. If you go into a mall right now, I remember St. Matthews never had one, neither did Oxmoor. Now they do. Yep. Okay, they say family restrooms, but it's, it's a unisex, you know, it's ADA and, and everything. But they had it before the ADA claim came out. That's what, you know, changed. The other thing that changed about this is that people 
have just looked beyond the smoke screen. They begin to educate themselves. And I know a lot of places where they had, you know, separate bathrooms, immediately put a sign up there and said, you know, with a man and a woman and stuck it on the door. You know, because they said, well, we're going to be in compliance. Um, where I work at, you know, I remember having the bathroom conversation, you know. And they said, well, you can use the bathroom downstairs in the, lo in the locker room. Okay, which locker room? Well, the women's locker room. Why did you send me? Okay, I'm not even going to argue the point. I'll just go. And after a while, I was heading to the bathroom. I went to go downstairs, and they, uh, one of the supervisors said, where are you going? I'm going to the restroom downstairs. No, go right there. That, that's ridiculous. People changed when they started seeing it, and it became a non-issue. You know, once the fear got out of the, you know, fear mongering got out, and out of the way, people would be like, you know, this is just ridiculous. So, hey, yeah. Yeah. Two points. Two oh, points. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, David, David had one. Oh, yeah, I just had a quick <laughs> sorry. thing. A uh, couple years ago where I was working at the time, uh, we had a, a young man who uh, was transitioning, and he went into the boss and told him exactly what was going to go on. Um, there was two points there. First, the boss, he was from New Jersey, the New York area, and uh, he didn't know quite how to uh, handle the situation. He'd never handled it before, so uh, I decided to meet with him and sit down and talk to him about it a little bit. And uh, The first thing I told him is, well, you know, uh, Louisville has a, an ordinance that protects transgenders against discrimination of any type. And he said, oh, it does? <laughs> that, that kind of surprised me, actually, because here he was running a business in Louisville, but he didn't know all about the, the local fairness ordinance. And then I said, well, yes, we passed it three years before New York City. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we talked about the issue a lot. And uh, the young man was transitioning, and he said that he was going to have to use the restroom, which was the main issue. Um, and uh, there, it was a, a couple of weeks, it was a little touchy there with some of the women. But I think the main point that I'm getting at is without a strong support from the management at the company and from the leadership in the company, uh, he might have had a, a much tougher time. You know, the company put his, their full faith behind them, full support, and they said, you know, we're not going to tolerate any kind of um, problems because of this uh, you know, man who's transitioning to a woman wanting to use the women's restroom, just get over it. Well, after about two or three weeks, uh, it was basically a non-issue. Yeah. So, but I think it, it does take a strong leadership from uh, business leaders to, uh, uh, to that, it, that really is, makes the difference. Yeah. And that's what these laws do, they provide a backbone for that, you know, opportunity. Hey, Steve. Okay. Um, I happened to be one of the people at the meeting with the three aldermen in 1989, or 1998. Yeah. The three aldermen were, of course, Unseld, Reginald Meeks, and Paul Bather, just to, just to clarify that. Yeah, Tina was there too. And Tina was there. Yeah, I think Tina walked in late to it. Well, there's for calling her out. <laughs> but it was definitely Bather and, uh, and Meeks. Um, that was an interesting meeting. I was in on that one. Um, I remember, I remember Unseld's exact words a little bit differently. My my re my recollection was that he stretched out in his chair, kind of like this, and says, "I don't understand all the alphabet soup you're throwing at me, but I believe in civil rights and human rights, and you all look human to me." Huh. And that's why we have all. That's why we always liked Mr. Unsel so much. Yeah. I like the councilman Unsel. It sort of becomes a, a Paul Bunyan. It's a tall tale in a bit, and it's sort of everybody has a different experience of the same. But Maybe when he shook my hand, it was like two. I recognize. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll take one more question in the interest of time. If anybody's got one out there. And if, oh, yeah, I, was, I have, it's a bit more of a comment. Um, Chris and several of the um, panel folks talked about the issue of oppressions intersecting. 
And when we look at, as the panelists have talked about, why our society has such intense issues with needing to know what gender is what and having a certain gender expression means female and a certain gender expression means male has a lot to do with the oppression of women in yeah. our society. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the fear around the feminization of men um, and the masculinization and the power that might go with that for women um, and that that oppression of women in our society takes very concrete forms, whether it be women getting paid less, women being more vulnerable to violence. When you look at the violence statistics, and I think folks said that up here, against the LGBT community, there is a very high level against, um, against trans folks, especially though folks who present as female when society wants to say, oh no, they're supposed to be male, and then a different kind of violence, like I'm going to show you, I'm a man, I'm going to show you, to, um, to folks who present as um, a, a, the gender identity male and being biologically female. So it's a very much linked in with the whole issue of oppression against women. And, you know, when we think about battling for LGBT rights, Unless we're dealing with how racism impacts in the society, how uh, women's oppression, how disability issues, um, we end up not only leaving people out, but we weaken ourselves. And I just want to end with really appreciating um, trans folks um, and butches and femmes and, and queens and all the folks who made this campaign stronger. Because in too many communities that fight the battle around gay rights, it's seen as we've got to hide those people away. Yeah. We've got to put the folks wearing the pants in dresses and the folks wanting to wear a dress in pants. And that is a way that weakens all of us. So I really want to celebrate the brave folks. I saw one more hand up back there if you want to ask your question. Well, this is changing the subject a little bit, but um, I, I'm here in an effort to become more aware of the issues facing the trans community and to learn. Uh, and I'd be interested in hearing a response to the question of, is, is trans inclusion a human rights issue? Yes. Yes. But, but yes. why? <laughs> I mean, it, but to really unpack that, what for someone who is completely ignorant that we may encounter, what, what language do we use, what, uh, what language do we not use, How, what, what do we do to really um, be an advocate for the trans? I, I think some other folks will probably want to address that, but um, sometimes um, numbers speak loudly, and I'm just going to share a few numbers with you all before we end it, and I, maybe I'll share some now so that you can understand how this is a how trans discrimination impacts the humanity of trans individuals in a disproportionate way than it does the rest of the community. I mean, it's particularly salient. So we're talking nearly 50% of transgender individuals are the victims of physical or sexual assault at some point in time in their life. Half, wow. I mean, wow. half. So one out of every two trans folks you meet, and, and likely more than that, because physical and sexual assault is woefully underreported in the trans and particularly trans people of color community. So I'd say probably, you know, a three quarters is what we're likely talking. Um, a, a fifth of them have reported being refused medical care. More than half of them have reported that they have had to personally educate their health care professional, their doctor, on their issues. Imagine having to walk into the doctor's office and the onus is on you to tell the doctor how to treat you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, think about how that's paradigm shifted. 53% um, have reported being verbally harassed in a public accommodation, so again, more than half. Uh, nearly half of all trans folks have attempted suicide based on this discrimination. 20% of them live in abject poverty. 20% of them have experienced homelessness. 20% have reported being denied housing, being denied renting an apartment, renting a house. 
And, and this is not, so no, all of these numbers are true, but then know that the numbers for trans people of color are once more disproportionately higher than the numbers that I'm reading out to you. So you can add 20 to 25, 30% or more on every statistic that I'm giving you, and that's for the, the trans uh, people of color population. A fifth, at least a fifth, have been harassed by police. More than 50% refuse report that they refuse to report anything to the police because they have been harassed verbally or physically and oftentimes sexually by members of the police force. And once again, particularly for folks of color. Uh, I mean, a good number of the trans folks that I know have, have been victims of sexual assault and have been victims of sexual assault, some of them, from police officers. Mm -hmm. And they're, they feel entirely helpless. Um, uh, a quarter of them have reported losing a job. Nearly 50% of them uh, report uh, not being hired or being denied a promotion because of their gender identity. 90% of them report harassment in the workplace in some form. So that's almost 100% right there. In terms of children, so K through 12 folks who are in the trans community, 80% of them have been the victims of harassment, 35% report being victims of physical assault, and nearly 15% of them the victims of sexual violence. This is before they graduated high school, within their schools. So uh, I just wanted to share those numbers with you. There are so many more that I will not share with you. Uh, this is a report from the Gay and Lesbian Task Force and the National Center for Transgender Equality. This is just the executive summary. The actual report is massive. They uh, surveyed nearly 7,000 trans folks. So this is definitely the most comprehensive piece uh, of, uh, of trans um, experience that you can find out there. Uh, and then I'll share the mic here. Thank you. Um, one of the things you asked, I mean, the thing you asked is why is it a human rights issue, right? So here's what I think when I, when I was sitting here thinking about that. And so transgender identity is about who I am, right? And there, there are, our social identities are made up of, of a zillion different aspects of ourselves. But if I'm being told, okay, well I can bring this part of myself in the room, and I can bring that part of myself in the room, but this part of the, myself has to stay out of the conversation altogether, it's not going to be afforded any rights, and oh, since that's such an evident part of yourself, I'm not going to afford you any rights either. I mean, what ends up happening is we tell people, you, we tell, you're telling, an, out, I'm being told what my identity is going to be. One of my favorite t-shirts in the world is ratty and torn up and beaten to death. It comes from Camp Trans, which is a trans outpost outside of Michigan Women's Music Festival, and it's a whole different story. But it oh, yeah. says, no one can claim your gender for you. Fundamentally, no one can claim your identity for you. And when transgender identity, okay, we're talking about identity. We're not talking about, we're not talking about my physical I don't know how to explain this, but it, it's, 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 it's an integral part of who and what we get to be authentically. And so when, well, that part of you is not important, is part of the official mantra, it, there's a huge issue. I'm going to call it back to the end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the theoretical end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was officially repealed. We'll see how long it stands, but it was officially repealed, and it ended the military's policy banning openly, or banning, well, banning lesbian, gay, and bisexual people from serving in the armed forces. Transgender people were not included in that protection. Mm -hmm. These are folks who are willing, we are folks, and there are a number of us in the room, who have been willing to, to put our lives on the line for our country. For whatever reasons, we're not going to go there politically. But the point is that there are still people now who are serving in the armed forces, who now same-sex partners can come back theoretically to their homecomings and have all their, their spouses and stuff. There are conversations out there now about DOMA and about same-sex part, uh, partner benefits and everything else. But trans people are still, by federal mandate and because of their identities, mm -hmm. prohibited from being honest about who and what they are. It's federal policy. So 
is that a human rights issue, you tell them, if, if, if it's an issue, if it's a policy that says I don't get to be human what I really am, in the land of the free and the home of the brave, we got some problems. Yeah. As you're handing the mic over, I'll say there are eight countries that do allow their trans community members to serve in their armed forces. In two of those countries, Great Britain and Canada, go as far as to offer medical benefits for full medical benefits, including transition surgery for their trans members who serve. If you were to make a grid of all the ways in which we're privileged and all the ways in which we're targeted, I'm going to guess that the majority of us in this room fall across the lines. Like, I am privileged in that I, I got here easily from my car. I didn't have to park in a certain place. I didn't have to utilize certain accommodations to get here. Um, if I travel to Guatemala, I'm seen as wealthy. Um, there are so many privileges that we have, so I think it's important to look at where we fall on those grids, and even when I am living in my area of privilege, discrimination of people up across that line, and unfortunately that's how we talk about it right now, I'm hurt by that too. So when I'm in a community that does not include groups of people, I'm also harmed by that. I always think of um, oppression is smog and we all breathe it in and it gets choked up in our lungs and even if I'm not a person of color I am harmed by racism by what it does to myself and my culture and my humanity so I think that's a, another good thing to consider you ask at the end of it how can I be an ally how can I reach out um, be a friend you know, the Christian scriptures teaches us, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you wouldn't do it to yourself, why do it to somebody else? Mm. You wouldn't talk yourself down, why do you talk somebody else down? You wouldn't make fun of yourself, or, or maybe you do, I don't know. <laughs> but you wouldn't do it to somebody else, I mean, if you don't want it done to you. Um, you know, growing up African, you know, I'm African American, okay? Can't hide it. Don't tend to hide it, you know. I'm not bougie. I am who I am. Okay. Uh, I can just be as just as ghetto and gangster as one person, and just as bougie as the next. I don't care. I am who I am. And I think for a lot of people, when I came out, especially in the black community, I thought, oh boy, here we go. It was really funny to watch the sisters in my aunt's church rally around me. Because they let me know that's what the real power was. These, these jokers over here ain't nothing, okay? And if you think I'm joking, anybody here who's been to a black church, you know who run it, okay? Uh, you know. But with all that said, it was, for some people, it was that, well, you know, we're losing somebody. You know, it was almost like a death. Yes. And I remember my uncle when I thought I told him, he left the house. Didn't come back for hours. This man was a United States Marine. This man <clears throat> was told from day one when he was in World War II, you're in the bottom of the ship and you're going to either press our clothes or you know, cook our food or you carry our dead. That's what you're going to do. And on one of those islands, they figured out they needed every Marine they could get their hands on. And he hit the beaches. In his career, he earned his stripes and lost his stripes three times. And he finally kept them. They didn't see at the end of that he was black. They seen him as a Marine. So when I came to his house, you know, and he had helped raise me. And I came to his house, you know, and I was always told to wear a baseball cap. You know, I had boobs, so I had to, you know, cut, wear an oversized. And I was like, this is ridiculous, you know, there's no way. And I came in, and he met me at the door of their condo. And I was like, oh, I guess you're going to block me out. And he said, come with me. And I came with him. He didn't say much to me. And we got off the elevator on the floor and we opened the door and there was a woman there. She said, oh, hi, Mr. Johnny, I'm so glad to see you. It's a white woman, you know. 
and they were talking and he pulled out some money, he bought this little blender, which I was like, why did you buy a blender? You don't use it. Well, I don't know. And as we were getting on the elevator, he broke down and started to cry. Because the man that played checkers with him was a gay man who could not have his partner in that retirement community. And he apologized to me. He said, I was blind because I didn't realize what you were dealing with. He said, so whatever you do from this point out, you continue to fight. Because you represent more than just black. You represent the family. You represent your friends. You represent your church. You know, I even take it a step further. I'm a championship fencer. I represent the fencing community. I represent my club. I represent the kids I teach. You know, I represent charter communication where I work. I represent a lot of people. So when you have that sitting on you, you think I'm going to turn around and disrespect anybody? Because I represent them and they represent me. We're not all going to agree. Guarantee you that. Okay? So when you want to be an ally, when you want to figure out what that means and how you can reach out, simply if you know somebody who's a friend or you don't know if you heard, walk up to them and say, hey, why don't we go have a cup of coffee and tell me about what you said. I just wanted to say there's no way that I could follow that. <laughs> that was very moving, Tom. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, as David said earlier, we still have a lot more work to do. I ask that before you leave, you visit the information table in the back and fill out two postcards. There's one of each color. There's a yellow one and a blue one. You need to fill both of them out. We will send them to your state representative and your state senator to advocate for passage of a statewide fairness law. Because as you've heard up here, if you drive outside of Louisville or before you get to Lexington, you can still be fired from your job you can still be denied a place to live, and you can still be legally kicked out of a restaurant or off of a bus if someone thinks that you are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. You don't have to be. The perception just has to be there. And you have no legal recourse whatsoever when you are barred from entering that restaurant or denied a room in that hotel, and you are stranded with nowhere to go. It's legal today. So I need you to fill out both of those postcards. Uh, I need you to go to the Transgender Day of Remembrance service. Yes. Uh, yes. If you are um, here in Sunday. town on Sunday, Sunday, it's at 7 p.m. It's in the center of the University of Louisville's campus. If you're familiar with the Red Barn, if you're not, look for the clock tower. You're very close there. So University of Louisville campus, 7 p.m., <laughs> the Transgender Day of Remembrance service. That's the time where we will um, memorialize the more than 320 transgender individuals who have been brutally murdered across the globe since 1970, of whom we know. So let's be clear, 328, which is the number this year, is not the total sum of transgender individuals who have been brutally murdered across the globe. But those are the folks of whom we know, and so we can memorialize those that we know. Um, Eight of those have been added this year. Two Louisville names appear on the list. One in 2005 and one in 2008. So I ask you to please come. Um, I want to give a, a warm round of applause and thanks for Sienna, the Transgender Support Group, and their president, Holly Knight, who is here tonight. There's uh, several more events as part of Transgender Week of Awareness, not just the Day of Remembrance Service. Uh, so I ask you to see Holly Knight to find out about those or uh, visit the Fairness Campaign's Facebook site uh, or our Twitter account or our website and you can grab a link to the other events that uh, are going on this week for Trans Week of Awareness. And I also want to give a huge thanks and round of applause to Heather Thiessen and the Women's Center here at the Louisville yes. Presbyterian Church.
our game show host, Chris Harvick.